If you've heard of category theory before, then you've probably also heard of the Yoneta lemma. If you've studied category theory before, then you've probably also proven the Yoneta lemma as homework, and came to realize that it's really not that hard to prove. You really have to cross your T's and dot your I's to make the proof fit even half a page. On the other hand, the Yoneta lemma is often described as such a fundamental result in category theory. But how could such a simple result be so important? Well, this is because once you truly understand the Yoneta lemma, your mathematical perspective fundamentally changes. You come to realize that all results in category theory are trivial. I guess I should explain what the Yoneta lemma is. There's a handful of ways to state the Yoneta lemma, but my favorite is that every category is a category of sets. With clear and concise explanations like this, I think I qualify to write the idea sections of NLAB wikis. Although my tongue is very firmly pressed against my cheek, I've used this idea before when I talked about limits. For example, if x and y both map into z, then we can contemplate the fiber product of x and y over z which is the universal object equipped with projection maps into x and y such that the two paths to z evaluate to the same map, where being universal means that any other object which projects onto x and y in the same way must map uniquely into the fiber product compatibly with its own projections. If all the objects present are just sets, though, we find that the fiber product is just the set of pairs of elements, one from x and one from y, satisfying a very simple equation in z. This is much simpler, right? Well, the Yoneta lemma gives us a way of doing almost exactly the same thing in an arbitrary category. To understand how this works, we need to review what elements are. This was explained in Daniel Kahn's first year calculus course. Actually, it would probably help to just watch that one, because I'm not sure how informative this TLDW is going to be. The key observation is that elements of a plane set naturally correspond to functions from a singleton into that set, where the singleton's unique element is mapped to the element of the set we're interested in. This is what bridges the set theoretic formulation of the fiber product with the category theoretic one. As Daniel Kahn teaches us, objects of other categories may also have natural notions of elements, and we might even be so lucky as to find an object such that mapping out of this object corresponds to picking out these desired elements. However, not only does the element picking object vary greatly depending on the category, most categories won't even have a suitable choice of object, and it may not even be clear what elements opt to be for objects in some categories. Being clever is the antithesis of category theory, so in order to avoid being clever about what elements are in some category, or which object to use to pick out elements, the big idea is to just not make a choice at all. Specifically, if particular objects in particular categories are capable of picking out the correct notion of element, maybe each object of a general category picks out its own kind of generalized element. In other words, given some object x of an arbitrary category, a generalized element of x consists of a choice of some object s of the same category and a choice of a map from s to x. In particular, by fixing our choice of object s, we can construct a genuine set from our object x. What's more, any map between objects from x to y defines a genuine function of sets from the s-shaped elements of x to the s-shaped elements of y. We can use these generalized elements to make more sense of the category theoretic fiber product. Specifically, the set of S-shaped elements of the category theoretic fiber product of X and Y over Z is exactly the set theoretic fiber product of the corresponding sets of S-shaped elements of X and S-shaped elements of Y over S-shaped elements of Z, and this correspondence is pretty much by definition. Now, this is neat and all, but I'm sure you have a number of questions, so please raise your hands so we can keep things but civil. But gee! I mean, I told you to raise your hand, but whatever. Isn't this a family of sets, rather than just a single set? You're right that it's not just a set. It depends on the chosen shape object S, after all. But it's also more than just a mere family of sets, too. Specifically, these various sets are connected to each other. Whenever I have a map between two of these shape objects T and S, I get a corresponding function sending the set of S-shaped elements to the set of T-shaped elements. Combined with some obvious but irrelevant identities, all of this culminates to say that the family of sets of elements of an object X is a presheaf. It's through these presheaves that we can take set theoretic constructions and pull them back to arbitrary categories. But gee, I hear you wondering. How are you sure we are not losing information by passing to presheaves? Good question. This construction implicitly assumes that an object X can be recovered from its associated presheaf, which is not clear a priori. 
If we wanted any hopes of proving this statement, we need the statement to be phrased more precisely. What we expect to hold is that if x and y are equal as presheaves, then they should also be equal as objects of the underlying category. Hmm, maybe I should use some more deliberate notation to discern an object from its associated presheaf. Some individuals might feel the urge to denote the presheaf represented by an object x as yo sub x. Said individuals would be fairly classified as FULL-ON DISGUSTING UNHYGIENIC WEEABOOS I am going to use the somewhat more standard notation and denote the presheaf represented by x with h sub x, where the h stands for <clears throat> hom sets into x. It takes a certain level of degeneracy to do category theory. Okay, now the claim is a bit more understandable. Sort of. There's still one more thing to clear up. What is equality? I know this sounds like philosophical nonsense, but don't be ridiculous. This is categorical nonsense. Riddle me this. As monoids, what's the difference between even and odd numbers under addition, plus and minus one under multiplication, and the following two matrices under matrix multiplication? I mean, sure, they aren't strictly the same, but as far as their monoid structures are concerned, they're pretty indistinguishable. Their operation tables are identical in shape. The only way you can really tell these things apart is by using non-monoidy language, which, for our purposes, is <laughs> Assuming we don't want to be evil, How do we formalize that these three monoids are the same? Well, they're the same if we can come up with invertible structure-preserving maps between them. Such maps are called isomorphisms. So, what we're really checking is that x and y are isomorphic whenever their associated presheaves are. I know I've been really going to town with the interpretation of the Yoneda lemma as saying that presheaves are giving a way of treating objects like sets, but I feel legally obliged to mention that some people rephrase this claim as saying that you are completely determined by your interactions with others. Don't get me wrong, I think romantic quotes are beautiful. The objects of one's character is not but a set, comprised of one's interactions with others as its elements. Quotes usually sound as beautiful as they are reductive. You might get the impression that this maxim is the Yoneda lemma, but it's not. This is a consequence of the Yoneda lemma, a mere shadow of the original statement. But gee, you might be thinking, you started this video out with an even more reductive interpretation of the Yoneda lemma. True, but the difference is that my reduction makes no sense and has no risk of being misused. This objects are determined by their interactions take is why I don't tell neuroscientists that I studied higher category theory. <clears throat> anyway, to talk about isomorphisms of presheaves, it would be best for us to understand the maps of presheaves in general. Luckily, these transformations are quite natural. <laughs> if presheaves were just families of sets, then maps of presheaves would just be families of functions of sets. Of course, presheaves are more than just families of sets, since, as we've seen before, we can map between sets of a presheaf. To be an actual natural transformation of presheaves, the family of functions needs to respect these vertical maps. If you reach deep into your short-term memory banks, you'll remember that a map f of objects from x to y induces a function of sets from s-shaped elements of x to s-shaped elements of y. A simple unwrapping of definitions shows us that this f lower star is indeed a natural transformation of presheaves. After some other pedestrian checks, we arrive at the conclusion that if x and y are isomorphic, then their corresponding presheaves are isomorphic as well. But gee, you say, that is the opposite of what we wanted to prove. Yes, we need to go the other way. While it's very straightforward to see how to send maps of objects to natural transformations of presheaves, what we're trying to do is more homo-backward. Get it? Because we're going back to homo more. This homo-backwardness is in fact true, and implies our original claim as well. Some people might tell you that this more general claim is the Yoneda lemma, but this is again just a shadow of the full-on result. In their defense though, it's a very useful consequence of the Yoneda lemma. It says that we can embed our category fully faithfully inside its corresponding category of presheaves. This means that every category can be thought of as consisting of certain presheaves, and this perspective is lossless up to isomorphism. 
Moreover, since presheaves have an obvious notion of elements, presheaves can be thought of as essentially sets. And this brings us to my original rendition of the unit dilemma. Every category is a category of sets. But, but, but gee, you say. If presheaves also form a category, then doesn't that mean there are two notions of an element for a presheaf? Thank you for asking the obvious question that everybody was definitely thinking. Yes, presheaves with their natural transformations do form a large category from our small starting category C, so of course any budding category theorist can't resist the urge to apply the same theory onto itself, even if it violates very fundamental principles of set theory. Luckily for us, set theory is a dead field. This entire video hinges on the thesis that we can use maps into an object as a substitute for elements of that object, and this leads to the object's associated presheaf. In this presheaf, we can plug in objects and get genuine sets, so we have a much more classically palatable notion of elements in a presheaf. Just take an element of one of its genuine sets. But, since presheaves and their natural transformations form a category as well, the video's thesis suggests that the elements of a presheaf F should similarly be given by natural transformations into F. This is not necessarily a problem by itself. For a general presheaf G, there is no reason to expect that G-shaped elements of F would have any connection to elements of one of the genuine sets of F. However, things get hairier if G is chosen to be a presheaf represented by an object of the original category. Specifically, if S is some object of our category C, then there are now two notions that qualify as giving S-shaped elements of the presheaf F. First is the classically palatable way of taking some element of the genuine set f of s. But now we also have le nouveau concept catégorique de taking natural transformations from the presheaf associated to s into the presheaf f. Having two notions of s-shaped elements makes the whole idea of bridging between category theory and set theory clunky and awkward. Or at least, that would be the case if these two notions really were different. This is where the unit dilemma actually comes in. The Yoneta lemma tells us that these two notions of S-shaped elements of the presheaf F are the same. Every set-theoretic element of the set F of S naturally corresponds to a unique natural transformation from H sub S into F. This is part of what really allows us to cleanly adapt our set-theoretic minds to a more categorical perspective. Once you really internalize the Yoneta lemma, you'll notice a lot of conceptually opaque categorical constructions start to make a whole lot more sense. Before you know it, you'll start converting theorems into definitions and conjuring up completely non-existent objects that give you real insights into concrete classical objects that you otherwise never would have understood. If you're still here, thank you for watching. If you liked what you watched, there is a classically palatable way to express that somehow. If you didn't like what you watched, it's fine. Although your negativity may form a well-defined presheaf over my reality, the presheaf itself is not representable.